Angela, the woman who had cancer. How many people have seen that? Just a few of you, okay? So let me give you an update. So our last healing service, we had a lady come in named Angela, who's a friend of Jeff's. And we did not know Angela. She came up, and she looks fit. She looks fit. I didn't know what was wrong with her. I said, what can we pray about? She said she had uh, breast cancer. She had a tumor on one of her breasts, as well as a tumor that you could visibly see on her forearm. <clears throat> now, if you look on our Facebook page, you can go, and you can, it'll direct you to this video, and you can see her whole testimony. Anyway, so <clears throat> um, I'd been praying. You know, there's a lot of giants out there that I want to slay, but I was just focusing on two that I wanted to slay right away. I want, I want to see God uh, uh, heal people of a couple of things because of personal, you know, some of its personal reasons. We have friends and family and loved ones who have had cancer, who have died of cancer. And cancer is a big enemy, the big C. I want to see that enemy fall, okay? I've been praying, God, give me opportunity to pray for people with that so that that enemy will bend its knee and fall. And then I've been praying for God to give victory over cerebral palsy because we have loved ones and people that we know that suffer from that. I want to see that fall. Well, the first, the first giant has fallen, okay? Because Angela came here, and she asked for that prayer. And uh, I laid hands on her, and I prayed for her, and I said, Cancer, go right now. And she felt in her bra, she felt for the tumor, and it was gone. So she had her daughter who was there feel for it, and it was gone. And then the one on her forearm, it went down considerably. And it was hard as a rock, but now it was just spongy. And so um, I tried to, she left the meeting, and I didn't know how to contact her, but Jeff fortunately later on gave me her number. I said, come in, I want to ask you to give a little uh, testimony about this. And she just couldn't come in, wouldn't come in, whatever, for, for a couple of weeks. And then she came in last Wednesday, this, this Wednesday we just had, she came in, and she just showed up. I didn't know she was coming in. And she says, I just came from the doctor, and I've got the report in my hand. She has no cancer. The tumors are gone, <laughs> completely gone. Now, the doctor, the doctor told her that can't be, but, but I don't know what to say. He's like, well, there so, must be something we're doing wrong here because they're not there. We don't... I said, what about this thing here? She just got just almost no lump at all now, just a little soft thing. She goes, he says, that's nothing. It'll go away. Don't worry about it. There's no cancer. Amen. So uh, God is healing. We had uh, Essien in here speaking, you know, first service. He was here. I think he's left now because he's participated in the first service. But Essien, you see, a lot of people think, you know, you pray for somebody. I've seen a lot of healings happening since February. I mean, over 100 easily. But a lot of people think you pray for somebody and they say, oh, the pain went, and they go, well, maybe that's not the real deal. I'll tell you what, a lot of these things are the real deal, and some of these things now we have documentation. So Essien had uh, an eye pressure, I think it was like 47, which I'm told 17 is normal. So 47 is a lot. And the doctors told him that with that kind of eye pressure, he was going to lose his vision, he'd have all kinds of issues, and he came to men's fellowship. And so he brought this up and said, can we pray for you? Yeah. So we laid hands on him, and we prayed for him and said, I pressure, be returned to normal. Now, there was something we could test at that very moment because as he looked through his eye, he could see, you know, some distortion. So I said, okay, Essien, I want you to look now. And he looked at the lights, and he checked. He goes, looks clear now. So I said, when you go to your doctor, he's going to tell you your eye pressure is totally down to normal because the doctors couldn't do a thing for him. And he went to his doctor, and he got the report, and his eyes are completely normal. He has no pressure in his eyes. So God does the miraculous, and he's doing it in our midst. And he's doing it in our midst to get our attention because he wants us to participate. He wants us to be part of his great plan for the end times. He doesn't want Christianity to be something that's just talked about. He wants Christianity to be something that is visible on this earth, that people can see there's a difference. There is power. It's not just a philosophy. It's not like I can choose from the book of different religions and say, oh, I think I'll pick that one. That fits my style. No, this is the one that has power. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So uh, now my wife told me that Casey back here, Casey has a friend who needs prayer, right? Now, Casey, your friend is an alcoholic. Are they suffering from, like, uh, liver damage? All right, all right. Casey, could you come up here? 
Casey is not her friend, but we can pray in proxy. Now, we had uh, a woman um, come to this church sometimes named Maggie, and uh, she was there with Viona and myself. We went to Northgate Mall and were praying for people, and they were getting healed. And Maggie, remember that, Viona? Yeah, and Maggie uh, was so excited, she wanted her mother to be prayed for. Her mother lives in Florida, and her mother has arthritis in both of her knees and very much pain, a lot of pain. And so Viona says, why don't we use Maggie in proxy, and we'll lay hands on Maggie for her mother. And then Maggie says, well, I'm going to call my mom. I said, good, you call your mom, get her on the phone, and I'll have Viona lay hands on your knees, and I'll have put, you'll put the phone up to Viona, I'll have her speak the prayer over the phone. And she did that, and she was healed. Amen. Huh? He yes, he sent his word and over Sprint and healed him. <laughs> so, so right now, Casey, um, she's going to stand in proxy for her friend, John. Jim. Oh, Jim. Jim. He doesn't know, um, he doesn't know he doesn't the Lord? Know if he knows the Lord. Yeah. All right. But, Casey, you're going to tell Jim that people at this church all combined their faith together and prayed for him that he gets a new liver. Okay, and then he gets delivered. Not just liver, but delivered. Kidneys, too. Kidneys, too? Yes. All right. So let's all, in faith, just combine our, our faith together with this prayer. Jim. Father, in the name of Jesus, Casey's standing here in proxy for Jim, and it's as if we have our hands on Jim right now. And you said, these signs shall follow them that believe they will lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. And, Lord, you've proven that that's true. So we speak right now, we say to Jim's liver, we say right now, Lord, a new liver in Jim right now, a restoration of that liver right now in Jesus' name. All liver disease, go right now in the name of Jesus. Get out. We speak to his kidneys, new kidneys right now by the power of God, new kidneys, complete restoration right now in Jesus' name. In fact, we cancel all of the curse and all of the damage that alcoholism has done to his body in the name of Jesus, right now, we cancel it out. And we speak health from head to toe right now in Jesus' name. And we also speak deliverance. Amen. That demonic spirit of alcoholism. Yes. We curse you. We call you out in Jesus' name. Get out now and don't return. We break your hold off of Jim right now in Jesus' name. You have no more authority, no more power. Okay, I'll probably... You're back. I'm back, okay. So we speak to uh, Jim's, even Jim's desire. And we say, even now, Lord, create in Jim a repulsion to alcohol. That even the smell of it will sicken him. There will be no desire there whatsoever in Jesus' name. We also, Lord, say that we don't know where he is at spiritually, Lord. Lord, through Casey's testimony, through talking to him, reveal yourself to Jim, Father, in Jesus' name. Let the blinders fall off of his eyes right now in Jesus' name and let him see that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords and you're the Savior of all mankind. We thank you for what you've done right now. We call it done in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. God bless you. All right. Am I, am I on? I guess I'm on. Okay. All right, so this is the second uh, message in our new series titled Second Nature. Dictionary definition for second nature, when you say something has become second nature to me. I'll tell you something that's second nature to me, okay, is driving a stick shift is second nature. I don't have a stick shift, but I used to. I had them for many years. And I can drive one with my eyes closed. And, and there was a time where I hadn't driven one for 20 years. You shouldn't drive with your eyes closed. But I hadn't driven one. For 20 years, and a friend of mine says, you want to drive my car? I hopped in, and it was like, it was there. It was, didn't have to remember anything. It was like riding a bike. It was, became second nature. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to think, uh, let's see, I put in the clutch now, and I, I uh, put it in this. I don't have to think about it. It's become second nature because I did it so many times, so many thousands of times of shifting that now I don't have to think about it, right? Okay, so this is what the definition of the term second nature is according to a dictionary. Something you can do easily without much thought because you have done it so many times before. Hmm? Makes sense. Okay. Well, this is the thing. <clears throat> is you have, if you are a Christian, you have two natures. You have the one you were born with and the one you were born again with. A new nature. 
And by using or living out of your new nature, your new nature can become your second nature. It can become what the norm is for you. It can become what's natural to you. But the problem is so many people, when they receive Christ, they received a new nature, but they're not doing anything with it. It's like if, like, like, like if you didn't know how to drive a stick shift, somebody gave you the car, stick shift, and you never drove the thing. Well, guess what? It's not second nature to you because you're not using it. There are many people who are living out their lives, living out their lives through their carnal nature, the one they were originally born with, and have no idea how to live out of their new nature, of the spiritual nature. And this is a problem in church. You see, churches is this, is too many people have it wrong. And if your thinking is wrong, okay, you're going to make the wrong choices. You're going to go the wrong direction. You're going to believe the wrong things. And, and part of our thinking is this, is that uh, we'll come to church and somehow by hearing the message of God, we'll better ourselves, Okay? There's a problem here. You can only better yourself if you realize who you are and what you have. Because if you think you're still the same old person and you're just trying to take the carnal man and make him reformed carnal man, you're never going to walk the spiritual life. You have to recognize you're a new creation. Okay, And you, it, this isn't a fix-up job God is doing. He killed the carnal man. He's dead. So that we, we can live out of our new nature. And when you live out of your new nature for long enough, it becomes your second nature, which becomes actually your primary nature, and now it becomes natural. What should be natural for the Christian is to walk in the supernatural. That should be natural. Okay? That should be our norm in life. We've accepted Jesus into our hearts, and we've been saved if we have accepted Jesus, and we received a new nature. Let's look at 2 Peter 1, 3-4. Today, I want, my goal is for you to walk out of here recognizing you have this second nature, you have this spiritual nature, and you can live out of it. You don't have to live the way you've been living, okay? So, 2 Peter 1, 3 through 4, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. You know, just stop there for a second. What are you praying for concerning living a more spiritual life? Oh, Lord, help me to live a more spiritual life. Oh, Lord, give me more of your Holy Spirit. He says, I already gave you everything that pertains to life and godliness. When you start to acknowledge what you have, then you are allowed to use what you have. Because, you see, if you don't think you have it, you're not going to use it. I know for a fact that I have apps on my phone that I've never used, and I don't even know they're there, but I know there's apps that I don't know about. And if I knew that they were there, I could maybe then use them, but I don't even know they're there, so I'm certainly not going to use them. A lot of people don't understand when you got the Holy Spirit, you got the download of the full power of God in your life. And there's lots of things you can do if you just recognize you have the ability to do them. You can walk in a supernatural way. You can walk in a spiritual way. You don't have to walk your same old way any longer. You don't have to. So it says, we've received everything. He's granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him. You gotta, you gotta acknowledge he's God. He's God manifest in the flesh. He sent his Holy Spirit. His Holy Spirit lives within me. And his Holy Spirit is God in me. Right? right? Amen. Who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he granted to us his precious and magnificent promises. You see, here's the thing it says he's granted to us promises. Now, this isn't what this means. Think about it. He's granted to you a promise. If you had a genie in a bottle and you rub the bottle, the genie says, I will grant you three wishes, right? You don't go, praise God, there it is. Now I have three wishes. No, what are your wishes? What are your wishes? You know, so what? You got three wishes. Are you going to wish them? Are you going to utilize them? Are you going to take advantage of the three wishes? Or are you just going to say, I'm so glad I got three wishes. They're in the bank, but I'm not going to use them. Well, it says here that he's granted to us magnificent promises. You already have them. You've already been given the promises. They're granted to you. You can use them now. You don't have to wait till someday. Right now, he's grant, he said they're granted. Your promise has been granted. Okay? You have within you everything you need to walk in a supernatural life. Everything you need to live a godly life. Everything you need to live the overcoming life is already granted to you now. But I don't know that. Well, I don't know the apps on my phone, but they're there. Okay? We have to acknowledge these things. He's granted to us his precious promise and magnificent promises so that by them, you see, by acknowledging that you have these promises and taking advantage, actually utilizing the promises, you get to do something. It says that by them, you may become partakers of his divine nature. 
That's what he hopes for you. That's what he wants for you. Having escaped the corruption that is in this world by lust. The way you escape the corruption that is in this world by lust is acknowledging that he's granted to you all the power to live a godly life and then you actually take those things that he's given you and utilize them. You begin to walk in it. You begin to walk in it. You don't just talk about it. You don't say, someday I'll be perfect when I'm in heaven. But you say, right now, I've been given the Holy Spirit who has all the power that created the universe in me. And right now, I've been granted all the promises that were promised in all the Bible. They've been granted to me. They're yes and amen in Christ Jesus. And right now, I can live in those promises. I can utilize those promises. Now, if you don't think you have them, then essentially you don't have them. Because if you don't think you have them, you won't utilize them. You won't take advantage of them. You have to acknowledge, I do have them. I have everything Christ says I have. In fact, he says, I have in me everything I need for life and godliness. Don't I? Everything. Well, but I don't feel it. Okay, how many people in here feel radio waves right now? This room is full of them. What's wrong with you? Uh, There's one in the back. Jessica feels radio waves. She's an unusual one. Most of us don't feel that. Well, you know what? That's because you're not a radio. How many of you feel television waves in here? They're in this room, I guarantee it. Get a television and I can show you. How many feel television waves? All right, now here's a good one. How many of you feel the presence of the Holy Spirit? You know what? Yeah. Do you see? You do, have, you do have the receiver for that one. And we should be walking in that. And we should be feeling that. And that should be common to us. But a lot of us, I don't feel it. Well, you know, turn that thing on. Get attuned to that because you should be feeling the Holy Spirit because you are a receiver of the Holy Spirit, okay? His divine power has given us everything we need to live in his divine nature. You can walk in the divine nature. Divine nature, that word nature in that verse is physis. It means this, your inner nature, the underlying constitution or makeup of somebody. It's who you really are on the inside. That's who you're supposed to be. You're supposed to have a divine nature on the inside, that is not supposed to be something that is, uh, you know, separate from you that you hope to attain to someday. That should be in you right now, his divine nature. (laughs) The Bible is truth. That's what I believe. The scripture cannot lie. That's what I believe. Because, you know what? It's God's word and God can't lie. Even if we do not lie, still sometimes we can be mistaken, can't we? That's the problem with most Christians. They're not lying about who they are in Christ. They're just mistaken about who they are in Christ. They don't recognize who they are in Christ because they don't recognize who they are. They don't acknowledge who they are. They can't walk in it. If you can't walk in it, then your life is frustrating. But you hear about how you should be. You hear the word of God. And this is the thing, is that so many people, so many people in churches hear so much uh, word of God in them and find so little change occurs in their lives because of their misconception, which is this. The conception is, is that I am who I am, and that's who I was born, and I'm going to try to improve on that. You're trying to improve on your initial nature, your carnal nature. And you know what? Your carnal man can't be reformed. You have to acknowledge you have a brand new nature. You're not going to be able to fix up the old wreck, okay, and be walking in the divine power. You have to realize the old wreck has been trashed, taken to the scrapyard, and you're a new person. And the word is, for the, is fuel for the new person. It's not for the old person. The old person doesn't get it. It's not for the old man. That's why people can come to church, they can hear the same thing 40 years and go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Their life never changes because they're just working on the old man, trying to fix up that old heap. He can't do it. The word is for the new man. All right. <clears throat> man could be mistaken. You and I can be mistaken, but the word cannot be mistaken. So let's look at 2 Peter. 1, 3 again, says this, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who's called us by his own glory and excellence. Now, his divine power has been placed within us through the knowledge of who he is, who he is. When you acknowledge who he is, when you realize he is Lord of lords, he is king of kings, and I want to tell you something, if if he's really God, if he really is who he says he is, then he truly has all power over everything. And every time you acknowledge something has power above him, you're denying who he is. When you say, well, yeah, he's God, but, well, cancer's a tough one. I don't know about that. I haven't seen that healed before. You're putting cancer above God. When you say, yeah, he's God, but I don't think I can change. I've always been this way. You're putting your situation above who God is. You realize when you recognize he's above everything 
and you acknowledge he's above everything, then you know what? Everything is possible. Everything is possible. We have to acknowledge who he is. The acknowledgement that he is God, and he is God alone. And this acknowledgement places into our lives his divine power that is necessary for us to manifest his divine nature in every aspect of our lives. It says 2 Peter 1.4 again, For by these he has, he has granted to us his precious, magnificent promises, so that by them, so that by them, by his great promises he's already granted to you, you may become a partaker. That's now. That's not after you die. That's right now. Of his divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in this world by lust. In other words, having escaped the power of being driven by just your fleshly desires. You see, no longer do they have power over you. No longer do they have the control over you. But when you realize you have this divine nature and begin to walk in it, you go, you know, the flesh, not even listening to you. Don't even have time for you. I'm walking in God's spirit. I'm walking in my new nature. We're not simply to be observers of his divine nature. We don't just see how holy and perfect Jesus was, but we are to become partakers of the same nature that he had. Excuse me. The first time you were born, you were born from below. You were born on this earth. The second time you were born, if you're born again, you have a second time. It was from above. It was from heaven. When you are born spiritually, you are born with a new nature. When you are born from above, not from below, things are different. Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3.3, 3, Truly, truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God. Well, you know what? The children of God should be walking in the kingdom of God right now. But nobody can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Now that word, born again there, in the Greek is more literally translated, born from above. Nobody can walk in the kingdom of God, experience the kingdom of God, see the kingdom of God, unless they are born from above. But you are, if you are born from above, guess what? You should be walking in it and seeing it and observing it. You now have, if you've been born from above, you now have two natures to deal with. There are two trees in your garden now, okay? I've got water. All right, thanks. So... There are two trees in your garden, just like there was in Adam's garden. Now, the serpent could not compel Adam to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He couldn't make him do it. Adam had a choice. But Adam had the power to do it if he so chose, didn't he? All right, you have two natures to decide which one you're going to walk out out of now. You see, you were born with a carnal nature. You were born with this natural earthly nature, and now you've been born again, so you have this supernatural nature, this spiritual nature, this divine nature. And every day of your life, you've got to decide which nature you're going to live out of. And most people live out of their carnal nature. They live out of their earthly nature. They live just like they've always lived. That's what they're used to. That's what they know. That has become the norm for them. But Jesus has called us to something else. He said, I gave you this new nature, not so you could hang it up in the closet and never wear it, but so you could put it on. You can put on this new nature. And as you begin to walk in the new nature, and you begin to experience what life is like in the new nature, you begin to like what you're seeing because God's working through you, because God's moving through you, because you're experiencing fellowship with him. And as you feel the fellowship with him, you're drawn more and more towards walking that way. And after a while, you're walking in that way more often than you're walking in the flesh. And after a period of time, the things of the flesh begin to diminish in their power over you. Because you realize the pull of them is just not as strong as the pull to walk for God. And walking in the things of the supernatural, you feel freedom, you feel liberty, you feel empowered. And you decide, I don't want to go to the beggarly elements of this world. And then your new nature becomes your second nature. It becomes normal to you. And that's where Jesus wants us all to get to. 1 Corinthians, we have two natures. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 through 49 says this. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last man, Adam, that's Jesus Christ we're talking about, became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. Well, guess what? You were first born in the flesh naturally. And if you get born again, your second birth is a spiritual birth. The first man is from the earth, earthy. That's who you first were. The second man is from heaven. That's the new nature you've been given. As is the earthy, so also are those who are earthy. And as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. Did you see what that just said? 
as you were born in this earth the way you were born originally with the carnal nature, you're just like everybody else with the carnal nature. That comes natural to you. But it says, the other thing says, but when you're born from, hev- from heaven, you should take on a different nature. You should be like Jesus. See, being like Jesus isn't something we're trying to get to. It's something we just allow to, to live from within us, to live it out. Because Jesus is already in you, and he wants to live through you. And he wants to do his good works through you. And he wants to live his life through you. It says, just as we have borne the image of the earthly, earthly we will also bear the image of the heavenly. <clears throat> Our first nature is earthly. It's carnal. Our second nature is divine. You've always been given a choice. It's called free will. Adam was given free will. He had the choice to serve God or rebel against God. And not only did he have the choice, but he had the power to carry out whichever choice he made. In other words, he could decide not to eat of the tree of the the knowledge of good and evil. He could choose that and not have to do it. He could choose to eat from the tree of life, and he could do that. He could choose, and he could do either thing. But what happened when Adam ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Suddenly, he lost some power over his choice. He still had choice, but he didn't have the power to enforce it. In other words, he was in sin, and sin had him bound. And he might say, like many people have said, I wish I could be better. I wish I could not sin so much. But he was bound and didn't have the power to break free from it. When we received Christ, he gave us the power to be free from sin. And now, like Adam, we have a choice of which tree we eat from. We have a choice of which nature we live out of. We don't have to live in the carnal nature any longer. We were born that way. We had to live that way back then. But since we received Christ, we have been given the opportunity to choose and live out of the new nature. And not only have we been given the choice, we've been given the power to do it, the power to live a godly life. When we receive salvation, we receive God's grace. And people talk about God's grace. What is God's grace? Well, God's grace is his unmerited favor. But what you will also find if you study the word grace in the scriptures, it's associated with. It sometimes is even translated with the word power. Power. God has given us power through his grace. Not just favor, but power. Acts 4.34 says this. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And grace was so powerfully at work in them. Grace was working powerfully. Grace and power are as scripturally inseparable as faith and love, as healing and forgiveness. These go together. They're nearly always associated together. Grace not only accomplishes forgiveness of sin in your life, but it also gives you the power to live free from sin in your life. Now, here's a statement I'm going to make. If your grace allows you to continue on in sin, then it's not the same kind of grace that Jesus was communicating. Because you know he gave grace, but he gave you power over sin to break that. The grace that I received, that you should have received, gives me the desire to do right, and it also gives me the power to do right. It gives me both. There is, uh, you know, we know that we're in the last days. We know that the Bible says that, uh, uh, you know, the day is approaching even more so as you see the day approaching. We know that the, the last days, we're in the last of the last days, and that the last days soon, sometime, at some point, are going to finally end. The door's finally going to close. But it says in those last days, it says perilous times shall come, okay? It says men shall be lovers of their own selves more than lovers of God, boasters, blasphemers, proud, haughty, all these things it says about it. But it says that the people of the last days, one of the things about the people of the last days, they will not endure sound doctrine. They will gather to themselves teachers who will basically scratch their itch and give them what they want to hear. So preachers are preaching today a kind of grace that is not the kind of grace Jesus preached. Because his kind of grace was not just simply the grace that forgave you. It's the grace that gave you the power to live a holy life. But they're teaching a kind of grace that is you're just forgiven and you can just go on the same way you always have been. That's not God's kind of grace. That is not what Jesus preached. Jesus did not say continue on in sin. And in fact, he even said to one person after he healed them, he said, go and sin no more lest the worst thing comes upon you. So the kind of grace that is taught today, you want to fill a church up, just tell them, There's so much grace, you can live whatever way you want, and God's cool with it. But that isn't the Bible. And people who walk on in that kind of grace think they have freedom. Well, you know what? They are in deep bondage to the sin that possesses them, the sin that controls them. You want to walk in freedom? If you want to walk in freedom, 
you have to break the chain that is between you and the flesh, the sin nature. And we do that by receiving Christ's nature. There exists within us two natures. They coexist, just like the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We're in the same garden. But we still have a choice as to which one we eat from. The sinner has no choice. All he's got is the tree of sin. That's all he's got. That's all he's got. We've got two trees. We can choose from the tree of life. We can live out of our new nature. We don't have to be living out of our old nature. Now, God did not give us a new nature so that we could put it away, so we could save it till a better day, so we could just dust it now and then and admire it. He gave us a new nature to use, to live out of. Ephesians 4, 17 through 24. Now, this particular um, writer is getting a little pushy. This is NIV. It says, so I tell you this, and I insist on it. I insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. Oh, man, a lot of people would have left his church. I don't want you to live on in the same way. I insist that you change your ways. I insist that you don't live the life you used to live like the Gentiles live, the ones that don't know God, because you're the people that know God, and the people that know God should do great things and do great exploits and should live a different kind of life. Okay? She says, I insist in the Lord that you must no longer live as Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. It's all in their head. They're darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due, the, due to the hardening of their hearts. Okay? Having lost all sensitivity, you see, you can have sensitivity and you can lose sensitivity by resisting God in your life. They have given themselves over to sensuality. In other words, everything's okay now. It's all good. It feels good to do it. To indulge in every kind of impurity and they're full of greed for it. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You see, when you learned Christ, you didn't so learn him that way. When you learned Christ, you learned that he says, there's a new life with a new nature and you're going to make a new walk here. You're not going to live as you used to live. You're not going to continue on in the carnality of the flesh. That's not the way Christ taught us. 22nd verse, you are taught with regard to your former way of life to put off the old self. Put it off. Which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. To be made new in the attitude of your minds or the spirit of your minds. And to put on, you got to do it, didn't say God's going to thrust it upon you. You've got to choose it. To put on the new self. Okay, new self. What's he look like? Created to be like God. Whoa, like God. Okay. Do you suppose God gives over to the lust of the flesh? Of course not. This new self that you're supposed to put on is supposed to make you to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. That's what he's given us. Jesus didn't just die. Now, this has been said before. Jesus didn't just die to get you into heaven. He died to get heaven into you so you would be changed. He didn't just die to fix up the old man. He died to kill the old man and to raise up an entirely new being in his place. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says this. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Those are gone. Those are gone now. Behold, all things are become new. There is a new person in their place. The Greek word for creation in this verse is a word that means this, a creation that is always of a divine work. You see, when you were born again, you were made a new divine work in Christ Jesus, a brand new person, a person who is no longer a a victim, a, a prisoner of sin, but a person who can walk in righteousness and true holiness. But still you have that thing that God shouldn't have given us, but he did, which is choice. You know? Be easy if he didn't give us a choice. We just had to live right. But he gave us a choice. And so we have to choose which nature we will live out of every day. You have to choose to follow the flesh, which he's he's severed from being, being in control over you. Or if you'll follow the spirit, which leads to life. The flesh leads to death. The spirit leads to life. Ephesians 2.10 says this. For we are God's handiwork, because he created a new creation. We're God's handiwork, created in Jesus Christ, okay? We've been created new in Jesus Christ to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You know what? He made us a new creation so that we could do what he did. We could do the good works that he did. Jesus went about doing good, healing all that were sick and oppressed the devil. Are you doing that? You see, so much of church is about self-help. It's like, I've got this old broken down, the old man, and I'm trying to fix it up. Can you help me fix this thing up? 
Can you help me put a new coat of paint on this thing? It's falling apart, you know? Can you help me put some oil in the joints here because it's creaky? And God says, wait a minute, I did away with that thing. I've given you a whole brand new nature. Just throw that thing away. Consider that thing lost now. You've been completely made new. You are a new creation. Reincarnation, you ever heard that word? Reincarnation speaks about this. It's an old spirit entering into a new body. Now, in the belief of reincarnation, which is false belief, in the belief of reincarnation, what happens is a person dies, and when they die, their spirit, well, doesn't have that body anymore, so it goes to a new one. Now, if that person, if you're from the Hindu faith, if that person did not live an exemplary life, if they were kind of a low-down, you know, backstabbing, mean person, then when they went on to their new body, it was a body of a lesser nature. So, in other words, you, you were kind of a bad person in life, and you just died, well, now you're a dog, Okay? And you know what? If you're a bad dog, next time you come back is the flea on the dog, okay? And it just keeps going down from there until you start shaping up, and then you can move up again. So what happens is an old spirit is put in a brand new body, and it's recycled over and over and over. But that's not what Jesus did, okay? You see, he did it in the reverse. He let us keep our old body, but he put a brand new spirit in us, okay? So we may look the same, but we're not the same. That's the problem, is if you're looking through the eyes of the flesh, you look in the mirror and go, I don't think I've changed. But you've got to look through the eyes of Christ and say, wait a minute, my inner man is brand new. You have to acknowledge your new nature before you can live out of that new nature. You have to believe that you actually have it before you can do it. Now, that's true with everything to to do with faith. You have to first believe it before you can see it. You do have a new nature. Begin to recognize that. Begin to embrace that. Begin to acknowledge that and say, I don't have to sin anymore. I don't have to do this or that. I don't have to be a captive to this. I don't have to be a prisoner to this anymore because I have a brand new nature. And I'm created in Christ Jesus under good works. And I've been given all the power of God by the Holy Spirit to live a godly life. Right? When we receive his new nature, it affects every aspect of our lives. We're not supposed to think the same way. We change the way we think. We're not supposed to act the same way. We change the way we behave. You see, a lot of people, the problem is this, is they deal their whole lives with trying to reform behavior. But if your heart hasn't changed, your behavior will never change. You have to change the root of the matter at your heart. And God gives those who come to him a new heart so that out of that heart can grow new things. We think with a higher mind and a higher nature when we're in Christ. It says, 1 Corinthians 2, 16, who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. You know, to some people, that's news. They don't even know it. I do? I do? Well, you have it, but you need to dust it off and use it. You need to begin to be living through the Spirit. You need to get in contact with what's already in you. You don't need so many people have this visitation theology. I'm just waiting for God to come from heaven and and give me something from heaven. He goes, I've given you my Holy Spirit. How much more do you want? The kingdom of God is within you. How much more do you need? We need to acknowledge what's in us and begin to live in it. Okay? We have the mind of Christ. We need to begin to use it. We have the Holy Spirit. He's a source of all knowledge. He's a source of all power. He lives inside us. What possibly more could we need than the Holy Spirit? We don't need more of God. We just need to utilize more of God that's already in us. The old man is dead, and we need to confess that. A lot of us don't believe he's dead. We say we're still that person. We're still stuck with that that life. That's That's the hand of cards we were dealt, and that's what we got to deal with. God says, no, no, no. You're in a whole new game now. Okay? That game's over. The old man is dead. Now, here's news for some people here, okay? Elvis is dead, all right? Elvis is dead. You got to get a grip on that. You got to embrace that, okay? Some people haven't embraced that yet. Oh, I saw him at a gas station filling up his limousine. No, Elvis is dead. He's not coming back, okay? What we have to understand is that the old man is dead. Oh, I still see him in the mirror every morning. The old man is the inner man. He is dead. He died on the cross with Christ. He was nailed on the cross with Christ. You have been risen up as a new man, and the old man is gone. As long as you still think he's here and you still believe in him, you're still going to live through that nature. We have to acknowledge the new nature. Colossians 2.20 says this. Now, the Bible is either true or it's not true. I believe it's true. So I have to believe what this says. It says, since you died with Christ, what? I'm alive. Well, yeah, the new you is alive. 
Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why is though, why is, why, why is this? Why is though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? In other, words, in other words, how come you're still led about by the flesh? Don't you realize that Christ has severed that connection? You don't have to live that one anymore? You're not under that bondage anymore? You don't have to do that anymore, okay? Colossians 3, 2 through 3 says, Set your mind on things above, not on things of this earth. For you have, this is either true or not, you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. The Lord gave me a revelation recently about this. Your life is hid with Christ in God. Is, uh, you know what? The enemy's out there. He's seeking whom he may devour. But if you're hid in Christ, you're not a target. Problem is, we keep sticking our head out. Problem is, we let flesh stick out. Instead of hiding ourselves in Christ and being in him where we're no longer a target, when the enemy looks, he just sees Christ and goes, oh my God, I'm running the other way. When he sees our head sticking out, hey, it's me. Flesh is still here. He goes, target. That's what happens. We need to hide ourselves in Christ. We need to be living in such a, a way that we are walking in Christ. We are living in Christ. We're talking in Christ. We're praying in Christ. We're doing everything in him. In him we live. In him we move. In him we have our being. The old man is dead. We need to bury him and get over it. We need to move on to a whole new life. Today you can start a new life. You go, but I've already been born again. Yeah, but you may not be living the new life. Today you can start the new life. It's been waiting for you. When Adam sinned, the soil of the earth was cursed. You know, God didn't curse Adam. He cursed the soil. But because the soil was cursed, everything from that point on that comes from that soil is corrupted. Everything. So he didn't curse the seed. He cursed the soil. Okay? So you can take the same seed that they had, we'll say, we'll say, if you took the same seed they had in the Garden of Eden where everything flourished, and you can plant it today, and you're going to receive a crop that's going to be just a shadow of what it would have been in that soil. All right? What you have to realize is in the parable of the sower, the sower sows a seed, which is the word of God. And the seed is received into soil or not. And it says that the soil represents the heart. Right? Well, God has given you a new heart so that his word, when it's sowed into that soil, can produce perfect fruit. And the problem is a lot of us are living out of the old nature and we're sowing the word of God. Every Sunday we come to church, hear the word of God, and we're sowing it into the old heart that is corrupt, the old person, the old man. And guess what? It never changes you. So you go, yeah, I've been going to church 40 years, still not change. You need to let that seed come into the heart, the new heart of the new man, which is good soil, and it will produce, and it will produce perfect fruit, the fruit of God, the fruit of, of love, joy, the fruit of all, the fruit of the Spirit. Meekness, gentleness, kindness, patience, all these things, they're, they're only going to take root in that good soil. So the word of God can be sown, it can be sown, it can be sown. And if you allow yourself to live out of your old nature, guess what? That perfectly good seed is planted in a not so perfectly good soil. And it doesn't produce, and then you wonder what's wrong, how come this isn't working for me? You have to acknowledge your new nature. You have to begin to live out of your new nature. You have to choose to live out of your new nature. It's been given to you, but it's your choice to live there or not. The righteousness that comes from our natural carnal selves, in other words, when you take your natural self and you try to live righteous, it's all an external righteousness. It's all fake fruit, okay? It's stuff that you're trying to polish up and shine up, but on the inside it's rotten. You want to live righteously? You want to live a righteous life? The real fruit comes from those who walk in the spirit, walk in the newness of life, walk in the new man. Not those that walk out of the old man and try to make him better. Not those that try to improve on their old ways. But those that recognize, I have been created as a new creation. I am a new creation right now in Christ Jesus. I have been created unto good works. Not so-so works, good works. I can do what he says I can do because he says I can do it. And I have what, I, what he says I have because he says I have it. And I acknowledge who he is. And I acknowledge that I can walk in his spirit and I can do exactly what he said I can do on this earth. You have to acknowledge what you have. We were not reincarnations, but we're recreations. We've been created in Christ Jesus unto good works. That is to bear good fruit because our new nature is free from the curse of sin. And our new nature is free to live for God. When we, need, when we embrace who we are and what we've been given, we can begin to live out of our new nature. Now, there was a verse that was read by Essien, and it talks about this, says, let your light so shine among men 
so that they might see your good works and glorify our Father in heaven? You know, I, something just came to me as he read that. I go, oh. So you're going to let your light shine. Now, don't we all agree that as Christians, we're supposed to be lights of this world? We're supposed to shine. So I want to be a light of the world, and you want to be a light of the world. Okay? So how do you become a light of the world? How do you, how do you expose your light to the world? How do you expose your light to the world? It says, let your light so shine so that they may see your good works. Huh? That's shine. You're going to shine the light of God by going out and doing the work of God, and people are going to see it. People are going to see God manifested in your life. If you're not going out and doing what he made you to do, people aren't seeing the light. What are the good works? Well, Jesus defined good works as basically this, is uh, salvation of souls. He says setting captives free, healing the sick, delivering the oppressed, all those things. We should be shining in those areas. We should be doing those things. That should become our second nature. That should become a lifestyle. There's a number of people in this church that I've been taking out here and there and uh, praying for people. And you know what? They only need to do it a couple times, and then I don't even need to bother them because it becomes this new addiction. It becomes their second nature that now whenever they're in 7-Eleven, when they're in a grocery store, when they're in a gas station, they're looking for people to pray for. They're going, she's got a cast on. I'm going to pray for her. That woman looks sorrowful. I'm going to pray for her. That man over there, he's in a wheelchair. I'm going to pray for him. It becomes our new nature. And God wants us to walk in our new nature. And he wants us to be lights into this world. Because as you're a light into this world, guess what? The people in darkness will see the difference. And they'll be attracted to that light. So we're going to close now. And I'm praying that for somebody, the light went on. I have this new nature. Yes, you do. But I don't feel it. doesn't matter if you feel it. It's there. You need to begin to embrace it. First of all, it starts with acknowledging it. It's not like, I have what God says I have. I can do what God says I can do. I can live the way God says I can live, and nothing can stop me. Now, I want to ask this. If there's anyone here today who has not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've never asked Jesus to come into your heart and be your Savior, then you know what? You are powerless. You are a victim. of. You are a prisoner of sin. You're separated from God. You don't know the love of God that he wants to show you. You don't recognize how much he cares for you and what he will do for you to make your life a blessing. If you don't know him, he wants to save you today. He wants to change your eternity right now. So if you have not accepted him in your heart and you would like to make a choice right now, a choice to be free, then I would ask you to raise your hand and we want to pray for you. We need We don't need to wait for any more stuff to come. You've given us everything. We don't need to wait for the Holy Ghost. We have it. And Lord Jesus, we just dedicate ourselves right now to saying, Lord, we're going to begin to embrace who you made us, the new us, that you've made us new in Christ Jesus so that we might live a life, Lord, that shines your light to this world, so we might do the good works, Lord, that you modeled for us that we should be doing. And so, Lord Jesus, we just embrace who we are, and we thank you, Lord, for setting us free. We thank you, Lord, for giving us of your spirit. We thank you, Lord, that we have the power to live a godly life. We thank you, Lord, that we can be the light to the people in darkness, and we can be the deliverers to this world by delivering the message of your salvation. We thank you that you've given us power to heal the sick, Lord Jesus, to declare liberty to the captives, Lord, to deliver the oppressed, Lord, to open up the eyes of the blind and the ears of the deaf, Lord. We thank you for that. And Lord, we want to begin to walk in that now. We want to begin to see things through your eyes. We want to begin to hear things through your ears. We want to begin to think things through your mind. And we want to live in our new nature, Lord. We want to bury the old man right now and never resurrect him again. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the good news, Lord, that we've been made brand new. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Uh, We look forward to seeing you next time. Have a wonderful day.